And hello everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you will enjoy this live legal educational content, and today will be the day I earn the subscription. For today's story, we are continuing our Great Cases series by talking about the case of Buchanan versus Warley, which deals with racial discrimination in housing, specifically as it relates to drawing lines by the government and whether those lines are appropriate or not. And this is a 1917 case. I will give you a little bit more about the case in just a moment, but first I wanna begin by talking about my friend, Nick Riqueda. Nick Riqueda, of course, as I'm sure all of you know, is a lawyer who has been on the YouTubes for a long time and has a very popular channel, or more point, had a very popular channel because his channel has been nuked by YouTube. This offends me on a personal level, as well as a professional level. Professional, because of course, if it can happen to Nick, it can happen to me. And personally, because Nick is a friend of mine. I've, I've been to his house. I like him. I find him to be a very kind person. I find him to be very generous when I've spent time with him. He is a person that is, that is kind and thoughtful and warm and he is well-educated and he has a irreverent style, which isn't everyone's liking. And I understand that. Not everyone likes my style. And I'm not saying that you have to like his style or not. You cannot like his style. But I think the fact that he's been nuked off the YouTubes for what seems to be very sort of superficial, trivial to non-existent problems is, is very concerning. And I don't know what the future holds for Nick. I can tell you, of course, that he has a Locals. So you want to check out Ricada.locals.com, of course, for all your Nick Ricada needs. For problems, possibly the indefinite future, he's been doing fairly well in his streaming over there and on Rumble as well. So uh, this may not be any loss to him personally, but it's a loss to us on YouTube. It's a loss to us who like him. It's a loss to us who enjoy his company. And it's, it's, it's just really stupid and annoying. And I just want Nick to know that if he's out there, that of course, if I can help in any way, whatever that would be, let me know. I, I think this is completely atrocious. Uh, I, I believe in freedom of speech. I believe in a wide diversity of opinion. Again, if you don't like it, don't watch it is always a viable option. But taking that away from everyone else seems incredibly petty, disingenuous, and just all annoying. So I I don't, know, don't really know what to say about that, except, you know, when I haven't had an opportunity to talk to Nick yet tonight, I called him to, to, you know, try to, but I wasn't able to reach him, texted him. He texted me back to let me know he was unavailable at the time, but hopefully I'll reach out to him in the next couple of days and we'll have uh, some more information going forward in, in the future. Uh, for anyways, uh, for the case for today, as I mentioned, we will be discussing housing discrimination as applied by the government. So let me give you a brief rundown of this case. This is Buchanan versus Worley. This was argued in 1916, decided in 1917. The facts of the case are this. Buchanan was a white individual who sold a house to Worley, a black individual in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville had an ordinance that prohibited blacks from living on a block where the majority of residents were white. Since eight out of 10 houses were occupied by whites, Warley was not allowed to live on the block. Buchanan sued Warley in Jefferson County Circuit Court to complete the sale. Warley cited the city ordinance as the reason for noncompliance. The question went to the Kentucky Court of Appeals Buchanan alleged the ordinance violated the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. The Kentucky Court of Appeals upheld the statute. Thus, the question presented. Did the Louisville Ordinance violate the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment? So, yeah, they just said, okay, uh, this black guy bought this white guy's home, and they said, you can't live there because you're black. Louisville had an ordinance that says, you can't live there because you're black. You bought the house, but you can't live there. And so the guy says, well, you know, I can't sell you the house because it's illegal. So is it, right? So that brings us to the case presented today. 
So let's do all those things. All right. So this is 1917, U.S. Supreme Court, 245 U.S. 60. It was argued in 1916, re-argued 1917, decide November 2017, or 1917, rather. Mr. Mr. Justice Day delivered the opinion of the court. Buchanan, the plaintiff, brought an action in the Chancery branch of the Jefferson Circuit Court because this is, this is dealing with land, right? He wants to force the sale of the land. So he wants the contract to be executed, but the remedy he wants is specific performance, right? The thing I want is the land, right? I don't want money damages. I don't want to go back on the contract. I don't want some other legal remedy. I want specifically the land, right? And that is considered an equitable remedy. And so in this time period, many states, and some states still do divide it, which I think is bizarro world personally, but some states divide, divide even today, courts of law and equity. I don't know why. I think it's annoying as hell, but I mean, that's historically what that was, right? We had courts of law and courts of equity, and they were separate things. Now, in most states, thank God they're united. But at the time, and, and we learned this, of course, recently in Delaware, where they were doing the same thing, right? The chancery branch was where Elon Musk was, for example. So also in Delaware, because I don't know reasons. Anywho, we want specific performance. That is, we want you to actually do the thing the contract requires, which in this case is give me the land. I want one land, please. For the sale of real estate situated in the city of Louisville at the corner of 37th Street and Plants Avenue. The offer in writing to purchase the property contained the following proviso. It is understood I am purchasing the above property for the purpose of having erected thereon a house, which I propose to make my residence, and is a distinct part of this agreement. Thou shalt not be required to accept a deed to the above property or pay for said property unless I have a right under the state of Kentucky and the city of Louisville to occupy their, this, the property as a residence. So he's got this clause in there specifically. It says, I'm not gonna go forward on this deal unless I can build a house there, right? So this is not a general, this is not, a, this is not what we call warranty deed. This is a specific deed because it's got some restrictions in there, right? I'm only buying this if you warrant some specific things. Like for example, I can build a house and live there. Okay, this offer was accepted. To the action for specific performance, I'd like one land please. The defendant by way of answer set the condition above set forth that he is black and that on the block of which the lot in controversy is, there are 10 residences eight of which at the time of the making of the contract were occupied by white people and only two were occupied by colored people. So, you know, 80%, 80% white. And thus by virtue of the ordinance, he will not be allowed to occupy the place of residence. He thinks that he knew this going into this and he wrote this provision specifically to test this ordinance, right? Me thinks, me thinks he wrote this with this challenge in mind because who else would think of that, right? Who else would think to put that in there except specifically and directly to challenge the law, right? So in the court of original jurisdiction, which is say the trial court and the court of appeals, the case was made to turn upon the constitutionality of the ordinance. Can we keep the black people out of the white neighborhood by law? The court of appeals said, yeah, no problem. Kentucky's like, yes, you can totally keep the black people out. That's totally fine. No problem. Again, it is 1916, so I mean, you know, still, but that's what the courts of Louisville, Kentucky said and the courts of the state of Kentucky said, so okay. The title of the ordinance is, and so now what is the city ordinance? An ordinance to present conflict and ill feeling between the white and colored races in the city of Louisville and to preserve the public peace and promote the general welfare by making reasonable provisions requiring, as far as practical, the use of separate blocks for residences, places of abode, and places of assembly by white and colored people, respectively. Uh, yeah, this is this is just this is just blatant on its face, absolute racism. This is just drawing a line in the sand 
and saying you can't live here if you're black even though you bought the house or bought the property so not a lot of ambiguity on that one by the first section of the ordinance it's made unlawful for any color person to move into and occupy as residence place of abode or establish and maintain as a place of public assembly any house upon any block on which the greater number of houses are occupied as residences, places, abodes, or general places of assembly by white people. So if it's majority white, not so much. Section two provides it shall be unlawful for any white person to move into and occupy as a residence, place or abode, or establish a place upon any house on which there's a great number of houses by colored people. So for whatever it's worth, it's, it's racist both ways. The black people can't move into the white neighborhoods. Also, the white people can't move into the black neighborhoods. So, at least it's equal opportunity racism, I guess. That's something. Okay. I, uh... Section 4 provides that nothing in the ordinance shall affect the location of residences, places of abode, or places of assembly made previous to approval. That's what we call a grandfather clause. So, if you're wondering to yourself, hey, on that block, there were 10 houses, and eight of them were occupied by white people. How did the other two black people live there? Well, this is how. They lived there before, right? They lived there before. So they are grandfathered in. So the black people, the two black people living on the white street, they're okay. But no new black people can move in. Incidentally, even into one of the black people's homes, right? So if one of the black people sold their home to another black person, that person would still be moving in and would still be in violation of the ordinance. So only the black people who are already there. The nothing contained therein shall be construed as to prevent occupancy of the residences, places or abode or of assembly by white or colored services or employees. Hey, good news, everyone. If you have any uh, colored employees who are gonna live in your house as your maid or butler or something, that's that's still totes cool so they can live there if you're if they're your servant or employee that's fine so that's we're, we're cool with that one all right fine and that nothing herein shall be construed to prevent any person who at the day of passage shall have acquired or possess the right to occupy any building as a residence blah 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 from exercising that right again that's a grandfather clause that nothing contained in this ordinance shall prevent the owner of a building who, whom the ordinance has been effective leasing rent or occupying as residence place of abode for color persons continue to rent it for such persons if the owner should desire so apparently if it's a rental property then yes you can swap out black people for black people that's totally fine but if such house should after passing the ordinance be at any time lease rented or occupied as a residence place of abode for white person it shall not be used for color people. So if you decide to go white, you can't go back. That's not usually how that phrase goes, but that's how I, I mean, yeah, once you once you go white, you can't go back uh, or something. What else does it say? Okay. Okay, that covers that, and then it does the same thing the other way around. Okay, so it's basically the ordinance. So basically, in short, again, yeah, you can't, you can't buy or rent, but you can have employees there, and if you're already renting to the coloreds, you can continue renting to the coloreds or continuing renting to the whites. You can continue renting to the whites, as the case may be, depending on which side of town you're on, but no new ones, right? So we're, we're just, we're just going to keep it down to the bare minimum. All right. So the ordinance contains other sections and violations of provisions as main offense. It's against the law. The assignments of error in the court attack the ordinance on the grounds that violates the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. In that it bridges privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States to acquire and enjoy property, take property without due process law, and denies equal protection. The objection is made that this writ of error should be dismissed because the alleged denial of constitutional rights involves only the rights of color per persons and the plaintiff in error is white. So one of the problems that they're saying is like, okay, um, you know, this ordinance is bad because it harms the black people, but the person who's suing is white. 
he's trying to trying to force the sale right he's like one i'd like to give you one land please you know i'd like to make you take one land please as the case may be and he's saying well you're not being harmed because you 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 can occupy the land and you could build a house there so that's fine so you don't have standing white person to which we all say but yes of course he's harmed because one of the things that you have when you own property is what we call a right of alienation right that's the right to not have the property right you have property you could alienate it which is to say it's not mine right by for example giving it or selling it away right the right of alienation and so like yeah i guess i could live there but typically property also includes the right to not property and i'd like to not property right now because i'd also like some money and hooray money right so that's the harm but it's like oh you're not being harmed because this isn't racist against you but it's har harmful against me because it hurts my coin This court has frequently held that when an unconstitutional act is no law, attacks on the upon the law, law can only be entertained by those whose rights are directly affected. That's standing. Only such persons as been settled can be heard to attack the constitutionality, but this case does not run counter to that principle. He has standing. He can't sell his land. He'd like to not he'd like to not have land anymore very much, and you and he can't do that, and so that's a problem. The property here involved was sold to the plaintiff in error, a white man, on terms stated to a colored man. The action for specific performance, one land please, was entertained in the court below, and in both counts, the plaintiff right to have the contract enforced was denied solely because of the effect of the ordinance. And, you know, it obviously impacts both people to the contract. Both people to the contract are harmed by its non-performance. At least, you know, in principle. The right of the plaintiff in error to sell his property was directly involved and necessarily impaired because it was held in effect he could not sell to a person of color who was ready, willing, and able to acquire the property and had obligation to take it. That would be the nature of the contract, right? He bound himself to take the land. And, you know, so he can't do that, so it hurts me. This case does not come within the classes where the court has held that one seeks to avoid enforcement of a law or ordinance must present agreements of their own and not rest upon the attack of an alleged violation of another rights. In the case of property rights, the plaintiff of error is directly and necessarily involved. He wants money, the other guy wants land, they've both been harmed. The guy doesn't have money, the other guy doesn't have land. They're both sad. That's, you know, that's a problem. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment on the lights. We pass then consideration of the case on the merits. So now that we've dealt with that standing issue, which was kind of toast on, let's talk about the merits of the thing. The ordinance prevents the occupation in a lot on the city of Louisville by a person of color in a block where a greater number of residents are occupied by white persons. Where such majority exists, colored persons are excluded. Literally no blacks here, please or not so much please, just no blacks. The This interdiction is based wholly upon color, simply that and nothing more. I mean, yeah, the only the only issue is color. There's, there's no other issues here. This is not a case where we have to figure out what's really going on because, you know, this is, you know, set up very cleanly. And so it's like, well, there's only one thing going on, it's race. In effect, premises such as these in question of so-called white blocks are effectively debarred from sale for persons of color because if sold, they cannot be occupied. That's a bit of a problem, right? That goes against the general warrants that come along with land, which is, for example, the right to build on it and live there. It's normally like one of the things that land comes with. So, yeah. Eddie, the best way to donate to me is either uh, is through Streamlabs. Streamlabs is fine, which is also the uh, the QR code on screen.
This drastic measure is sought to be justified under the authority of the state and exercise of police power. It is such legislation tends to promote the public peace by presenting racial conflicts. That is, it tends to maintain racial purity. Apparently, they view that as a good thing because that apparently is their argument. We are doing this specifically because it will tend to maintain racial purity. Well, that, that clears that up. That prevents deterioration of property owned and occupied by white people, which deterioration it's contended is sure to follow the occupancy of adjacent premises by persons of color. Okay, yeah. So this is being justified under the police power the general authority of the government to do stuff. States, of course, have police power. They have general authority to do stuff. So they can do all the things except, of course, where the federal government has power, or of course, the United States Constitution would otherwise forbid it, right? Because the states have all the residual power. And, you know, ordinances dealing with land pretty comfortably normally fits within police power. So normally the government can regulate land pretty extensively. But, you know, there are limits. I think we're finding some right now. The authority of the state to pass laws and exercise a police power, which is the general power to do stuff. Hello, fans of Law and Lumber. The authority of the state to pass laws and exercise of power, police power, which is the general power to do stuff, having for their object the promotion of public health, safety, and welfare is very broad, as has been informed numerous times. Yes, the general power to do stuff is very general. Furthermore, the exercise of power, embracing nearly all legislation of local character, is not to be interfered with by courts where it's within the scope of legislative authority and the means adopted reasonably tend to accomplish a, law, reason, a lawful purpose. That's basically true today as it was then, right? I, I, I we've, might have changed the language a little bit since 1917, but that's basically true today, right? This is rational basis test. So normally states have police power, which is the general power to do all the things. They can do all the things on a rational basis. So any reason will be fine as long as they have power. Pretty much anything will be fine. But it's equally well established that the police power, broad as it is, cannot justify passage of law or ordinance which runs counter to the limitations of the federal constitution. That's the supremacy clause for you. Right, The state cannot supersede the federal constitution or the Bill of Rights, and we're running into Bill of Rights problems as we're speaking. Thank you for the raid, and thank you, Tish in Tennessee, for the TOTC raid. It is appreciated. Thank you. For those of you joining us, I will give you just a brief catch-up on the case. We are reading the case of... Uh, Buchanan versus Worley, 1917. In 1917, Louisville, Kentucky had an ordinance which made it illegal for a black person to buy property for the purpose of living there if the block was already majority white. So if the block was majority white, a black person could not buy land or a house or otherwise occupy it for the purpose of living there if it was already majority white. And incidentally, also the other way around. So a white person could not buy a house for the purpose of living there if it was already majority black. And so this was the law in Kentucky in 1917. The Kentucky Supreme Court had no problem with this. They thought this was totes fine. And the uh, US Supreme Court is trying to decide whether or not it's okay for the city of Louisville to have a ordinance that, prov that legally prevents black people from buying housing because the block is already majority white. Is that okay or not? Let's read more. The federal constitution, okay. Uh, the federal constitution and laws passed within its authority are by express terms of that instrument made supreme law of the land. That's, yep, yeah, that's what it says. The 14th amendment protects life, liberty, and property from invasion of the states without due process of law. Property is more than a mere thing that a person owns. It is elementary and includes the right to acquire, use, and dispose of it. That's also called that right of alienation. I was talking to you about before. Disposing is alienating, not mine, right? The Constitution protects these essential attributes of property. Property constitutes free use, enjoyment, and disposal 
of a person's acquisitions without control or diminution, save by the law of the land. You get to use your property, enjoy your property, dispose of your property. That's one of the things you get to do with property. That's normally what we do. True it is that dominion over property springing from ownership is not absolute and unqualified. I mean, you know, fair. The disposition and use of property may be controlled in the exercise of the police power, which is the general power to do stuff, in the interest of public health, convenience, or welfare. Harmful occupations may be controlled and regulated. Legitimate business may also be regulated in the interest of the public. Certain uses of property may be confined to portions of a municipality other than resident districts, such as livery stables, brickyards, and the like, because of the impairment of the health and comfort of occupants of neighboring property. Many illustrations might be given from the decision of this court and other courts of the principle that these cases do not touch the one of bar. So basically, yeah, zoning ordinances are legal, generally speaking, right? Health and safety re regulations are generally legal. Again, the government has a lot of power when it comes to regulating property. In 1917 and today, they can have zoning ordinances, that's cool. They could say that certain trades and businesses have to be in certain parts of town for all kinds of legitimate reasons. They can regulate noise and pollution or you know anything that's basically regulating people's use. So your ability to own and use your property is not absolute. They can pass lots and lots of ordinances that control your use of property for the common enjoyment. All right, so is this one of them? Is I guess the answer the question now, right? So the concrete question is, may the occupancy and necessarily the purchase and sale of property on which occupancy is an incident, that is to say the goal, be inhibited by the states or by one of its municipalities solely because of color? Hey, um, you know how you have the power to like pass all the ordinances and stuff? Is one of the ordinances you can't buy this because you're black? Is that is that cool? Uh, that one may dispose of his property subject only to the control of lawful enactment, curtailing the right in public interest must be conceded. Again, there are lawful restrictions. The question now presented makes it pertinent to inquire into the constitutional right of the white man to sell his property to the colored man, having in view the legal status of the purchaser and occupant. All right, so we know they generally can do stuff. Can they do this thing? Following the Civil War, certain amendments to the federal constitution were adopted, which had become an integral part of the instrument, equally binding upon the states and fixing certain fundamental rights. Yeah. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery and in all places subject to their jurisdiction and gave Congress power to enforce. The 14th Amendment made all persons born or naturalized in the United States, citizens of the United States and of the state which they reside, which is always one of my little favorite little factoids that, you know, technically, of course, well, not even technically, legally, you are a citizen of the United States and also a citizen of the state in which you reside. So it is perfectly legal and correct for me to say I am a citizen of Texas, which the Texans will like. They will like if I say I'm a citizen of Texas, but that's legally true. I don't have to tell them that part. Okay. Let's see. Anyways. And provides no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privilege or immunities of the citizens of the United States. And no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process, nor deny equal protection. The effect of these amendments was first dealt with the court in the slaughterhouse cases. <sighs> yes, it was. Yes, it was, and we're definitely gonna cover the Slaughterhouse Cases as part of the Great Case series because they completely nuked the Privileges or Immunities Clause. It was gonna be great. It was gonna to be totally great. We were gonna have the Privileges or Immunities Clause was going to incorporate the Bill of Rights, but they nuked it and they nuked it hard, and it makes me sad. But well, we, we've talked about it before on this channel, we'll talk about it again, and that's uh, yeah, anyways. The reason for the adoption of the amendments was elaborately considered by a court familiar with the times in which the necessity for amendments arose and with the circumstances which impelled their adoption. In that case, Mr. Justice Miller, who spoke for the majority, pointed out that colored race having been freed from slavery by the 13th Amendment, 
was raised to the dignity dignity of citizenship and equality of rights by the 14th. That, that was the goal, yes. And the states were prohibited from abridging the privileges and immunities or depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process. While a principal purpose of the latter amendment was to protect persons of color, the broad language used was deemed sufficient to protect all persons, white or black, against discrimination. I mean, you know, no duh. I mean, it was to elevate black people into equal status. So it protects both white and black people. It protects people of all races. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. That's great. That is now settled law. In many of the cases since arising, the question of color has not been involved and cases have been decided upon violations of civil or property rights irrespective of color, right? You know, just because there's a case involving people of certain races or mixed races or whatever does not necessarily imply, of course, the case turns on race, right? You can have a case involving a white person, black people, mixed people. It can be a whole bunch of things, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean the issue is race, or at least that's the conceit which I tend to agree, right? Not everything is race all the time. Sometimes it's race and sometimes not. And the Supreme Court's noting here that a lot of the cases that were decided were decided on not race because not race. But this is very race. It's hard for it not to be race, right? So this case is squarely confronting the issue. In the Slaughterhouse case, it is recognized the chief inducement to the passage of the amendment was the desire to extend federal protection to the recently emancipated race from unfriendly and discriminating legislation. Yes, that was the goal. And you totally screwed it up. Supreme Court and slaughterhouse cases, and you made everyone sad. And then we had to sort of back end the whole thing through the uh, life, liberty, or property clause, and mostly the word liberty, which was a less elegant solution but that's all right, we can press on. In Schroeder versus West Virginia, this court held that a colored person charged with an offense was denied due process, which prevented colored men from sitting on a jury which tried him. There was a law that just said no black people can be on the jury. This is way before Batson, where we came up with discriminatory challenges. How about just black people can't be on the jury, period? How about we just have a law that says no black people in the jury? Yeah, that's that's a bit of a problem. Uh, maybe black people should be allowed to serve on the jury. Maybe that would be okay. So Mr. Justice Strong, speaking for the court, again reviewed the history of the amendments and said the following. The 14th Amendment was designed to ensure to the colored race the enjoyment of all civil rights that under the law are enjoyed by white persons and to give that race the protection of general government in that enjoyment of whatever should be denied by the states. It not only gave citizenship and the privileges of citizenship to people of color, but denied to any state the power to withhold from them the equal protection of the law. Hey, geniuses, maybe when it said equal protection, you should actually, you know, do that. That would be good. And authorize Congress to enforce this. It ordains that no state shall make or enforce any laws which shall abridge privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, which they are. It ordains that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process or deny any person within the jurisdiction equal protection of the law. What is this but declaring that the law of the states shall be the same for blacks as for whites? I mean, you know, duh. And they should be the same. Equal protection. I I can't, can't believe we have to explain this, but, you know, here we are. And in regard to the colored races for whom the protection of the amendment was primarily designed, no, no discrimination against them because of color. Yeah. The 14th Amendment makes no attempt to enumerate the rights it designs to protect. Yeah, it didn't have to. It was supposed to be great. The Privileges or Immunities Clause was supposed to do the full, four, full eight amendments by itself automatically, but we decided not to do that for some reason. But that's why I didn't attempt to enumerate them because it was all just supposed to be incorporated by reference, but okay. It speaks in general terms and those are comprehensive as possible. Its language is prohibitory, but every prohibition implies the existence of rights and immunities, prominent among which is an immunity from inequality of legal protection, either for life, liberty, or property. Any state action that denies this to a colored man is in conflict with the constitution. 
you know, it's pretty basic, easy. I mean, you know, that's kind of what the amendment says. Equal protection, all people born in the United States are citizens. And maybe you should just do the equal protection thing. That'd be good. This court in ex party Virginia said the following. Whoever by virtue of a public position under state government denies another property, life or liberty without due process of law or denies or takes away equal protection law violates the constitution. And as he acts in name and for the state is clothed with state power, his act is that of the state. Genius, like he's basics in some way, right? Guy who works for government is doing things in the name of government. Oh my God, it's the government acting. Wow, deep thoughts, right? But we'll explain the basics. We'll explain the basics for the people who are not getting it in the back of the room, right? In giving legislative aid to these constitutional provisions, Congress has said the following. All citizens of the United States shall have the same right in every state and territory, as is enjoyed by white citizens thereof, to inherit, purchase, lease, sell, hold, and convey real and personal property. And Congress also said, all persons within the jurisdiction of the United States shall have the same right in every state and territory to make and enforce contracts, to sue, be parties, give evidence, and the full and equal benefits of the laws and proceedings for the secure, security of the persons and property as is enjoyed by white citizens and shall be subject to like punishment, pain, penalties, taxes, licenses, and extractions of every kind and no other. Claude Simeon said, were Chinese considered colored or only black? Hmm. This is 1917. I'm trying to remember when, like, the Chinese migrations happened. Um, this is also Louisville, Kentucky. I don't know how they were treating it nationally, but they were treating it like... This is... I think this is a little bit early for the Chinese. But I'd have to double-check my history on that one. It's a good question, though. In the face of these constitutional and statutory protections, can a white man be denied, consistent with due process of law, the right to dispose of property to a purchaser by prohibiting the occupation of it for the sole reason the purchaser is a person of color? What script is blurry? The statute of 1866 originally passed under sanction of the 13th Amendment and practically reenacted after the adoption of the 14th Amendment, expressly provide that all citizens of the United States in any state shall have the same right to purchase property as is enjoyed by white citizens. Colored persons are citizens of the United States and have the right to purchase property and enjoy the same without laws discriminating against them solely based on color. These enactments did not deal with the social rights of men but upon those fundamental rights and property, which it was intended to secure the same terms to citizens of every race and color. Black people can own property too. That'd be fine. The 14th Amendment and the statutes enacted in furtherance of its purpose occup operate to qualify and entice a colored man to acquire property without state legislation discriminating against him solely because of color. The defendant in error insists that Plessy versus Ferguson is controlling in principle in favor of the judgment of the court below. Well, Plessy versus Ferguson hasn't been overruled yet at this point in history. Of course, it's 1917. So Plessy versus Ferguson is somehow still the good law of the land somehow, but okay. In that case, this court held that a provision of a statute of Louisiana requiring railway companies carrying passengers to provide in their coaches equal but separate accommodations for white and colored races did not run contra to the provisions of the 14th Amendment. So, you know, hey, separate train cars for the races, why not separate blocks for housing for the races? It is to be observed in that case there were no attempt to deprive persons of color of transportation in coaches of the public carrier. <sighs> And express requirements were for equal, though separate accommodations for white and color races. In Plessy versus Ferguson, classification of accommodation was permitted upon the basis of equality. So the, the concept of separate but equal is still tolerable, I suppose, at this point in history. 
And I suppose the what the court's going to say is there is this idea that no two pieces of property can be equal, that every piece of property is definitionally unique, which is kind of true in some ways, right? So is it like, can you have separate but equal cars? Well, I mean, I mean, they could be the same, at least in terms of their accoutrements, but no two pieces of land can be the same, even if they like adjoin each other stuff. I mean, there's going to be differences between them. So maybe that's what we're turning on, that the idea of equality in land is a, a nonsense idea, but it's okay in train cars. Maybe that's what we're going to split the difference on. All right, let's read on. In Barrera College cases, a state statute was sustained in the courts of Kentucky which, while permitting the education of white persons and, and black people in different localities by the same institution, prohibit their, institu their attendance in the same place. How about different schools? And this court of judgment of the court of T Kentucky was affirmed solely upon the reserved authority of the legislature of Kentucky to alter, amend, or repeal charters of its own cities. And the question here involved was neither disgu discussed nor decided. So they didn't decide on the uh, separate but equal schools in Barrera. They simply decided on the power of the state to uh, change the definitions of cities, which as far as I'm concerned, and I can't believe Barrera would say anything different, they can do whatever the hell they want because the states are sovereign. The, the counties and cities and other instrumentalities exist at the pleasure of the state. So can a state abolish a city or county? Basically, yeah. Uh, yeah. You might get into problems under the state constitution. So there might be something there, but that's just the state imposing limits on itself. So in Cary versus city of Atlanta, the Supreme Court of Georgia holding an ordinance similar in principle to the one herein to be invalid dealt with Plessy and that case in a language so opposite, we quote a portion of it. In each instance, the complaining person was afforded the opportunity to ride or attend institutions of learning or afford the thing of whatever nature to which the particular case was entitled. The most that was being done of him as a member of a class to conform with reasonable rules in regard to separation. And none of these was he denied the right to use, control, or dispose of his property. Okay, so we're going to turn on the fact that in the case of attending schools or in the case of sitting on train cars, your property isn't an issue. Okay. I mean, fine. Right? So, I mean, you do have a li right to life, liberty, or property, as we know. And so property is a specially enumerated thing. And so we can split the difference on the basis of it being property and not, for example, liberty. We can do that. That would be logical. So, all right, we can try that. By the way, when I say that's logical... I'm pointing, I'm not saying that I agree with it. I'm just saying that it flows, right? I'm simply pointing out that that the Constitution says life, liberty, or property. So those are three separate things. And so it is logical to say something is true for one of those, but not necessarily true for the other one of them because they're three separate things. And they because we use three separate words, they must have three separate definitions because it goes that principle in the Constitution and other statutes for that matter. When we use the same word, we mean the same thing. We use different words, we mean different things. So life, liberty, and property must be three distinct things. And so therefore it is logical to say, okay, this is a property interest and, not this, and, and to treat your ability to sit on a train car or your ability to go to school as a liberty interest. And therefore to say, okay, because this is only impacting your liberty interest, separate but equal is okay, but because this is impacting your property interest, not so much. So I'm not saying I'm agreeing with it, I'm just simply pointing out because there are three different things of three different scopes, we can interpret them differently if we wanted to. It would make logical sense to do that. All right, let's press on. Am I a lefty? No, I'm right-handed. I just uh, have a pen in my left hand right now because I don't know, reasons. Just something to hold, I suppose.
In the recent case of McCabe, where the court had under consideration a statute which allowed railway companies to furnish dining cars for white people and refused to furnish dining cars altogether for colored persons, the language used was in reference to contentions of the Attorney General. This argument with respect to volume of traffic seemed to us to be without merit. It makes the constitutional right depend upon the number of persons who may be discriminated against, where in the essence of constitutional right is that it's a personal one. So rights are, of course, belong to the individual. This is confusing. If there's confusion, I'm happy to try to clear it up. What is the confusion? If I can try to clarify. Uh, if there's confusion about things. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson is still good law at this point. So, you know, Brown versus Board of Education wouldn't happen for like another 50 years. So we've already established that you can discriminate. You, separate but equal is okay when it comes to train cars. We've already established that separate but equal is okay when it comes to schools. Well, actually, strictly speaking, we didn't decide that yet. That'll come later. that this is still the law of the land at that time, in 1917? Yeah, I mean, Plessy versus Ferguson was still good law in 1917. Brown versus Board of Education wouldn't happen for another, like, 45 years. I mean, you know, just have to remember what time period we're in. And, you know, if you were going to try to separate the difference, logically, if you're going to try and separate the difference on the basis of why it's okay to discriminate from one and not on the other, the fact that this is property as a distinct element in the, in the Bill of Rights is separately enumerated is a basis to split the difference. So, I mean, you know, and yeah, Brown is 1954, it wouldn't happen for another 40 years. So, yeah, I mean, you know. The effect of the ordinance under consideration was not merely to regulate a business or the like, but was to destroy the right of the individual to acquire, enjoy, and dispose of property. This is not a regulation. This is destruction of property. And that remains the standard basically today for Fifth Amendment taking purposes as well, incidentally. So the government can regulate you, then they basically can regulate you until there is no useful purpose of the land anymore. So when they're destroying property, that's where the Fifth Amendment comes out. Being of this character was void as opposed to the Due Process Clause. It doesn't exist. That there is a serious and difficult problem arising from a feeling of race hostility which the law is powerless to control, and which me, me, me given a measure of consideration may be freely admitted. But its solution cannot be promoted by depriving citizens of their constitutional rights. So there might be some sort of issues with race hostility. That might be arguably true today, depending on your point of view, or depending on where you live, but you can't say the solution to that is to prevent certain races from buying, whether they're white or black. As we've said, this court has held laws valid which separate the races on the basis of equal accommodation in public conveyance, and the courts of high authority have held enactments lawful which provide for separation in public schools of white and colored pupils where equal privileges are given. But in the view of the rights secured by the 14th Amendment, such legislation must have limitations and cannot be sustained where the exercise of authority exceeds restraints. We think that those limitations are exceeded in that ordinance that we're discussing. So, separate but equal is still a concept, but of course in land, no piece, of, no two pieces of land can be equal. That's usually the conceit. That's one of the ways, well, that's one of the reasons incidentally you get specific performance in land. 
specific performance is the is I want you to actually do the contract. I want you to actually follow through. That specific performance. I want the thing. Specific performance is a disfavored remedy, but it is a common remedy when it comes to land. So like Elon Musk was dealing with the whole specific performance thing with Twitter, and apparently he concluded that it wasn't going well, which I had said at the beginning, it wasn't going well. There was some evidence that helped him later on, but you know, I didn't think he had the best case. But, you know, force you to force you to continue to buy Twitter, right? That's specific performance. That's what they were asking for. And specific performance is an unusual remedy, but you get it in the land because the idea is that no two pieces of land are identical. They can't be, they're not fungible. It is the purpose of such enactment, and frankly avowed it will be their ultimate effect to require by law, at least in resident districts, the compulsory separation of the races on account of color. Such action is said to be essential to the maintenance of the purity of the races, which apparently is a worthwhile goal in 1917. Although it is to be noted in the ordinance under consideration that the employment of colored servants in white families is permitted. Yeah, the, the black people can live at the white homes as long as they're, they're servants. That's fine. And nearby residences of colored persons not coming within the block are not prohibited. So, like, there can be black people in the next block over. So it doesn't even really try to solve the problem you're trying to solve all the way. The case presented does not deal with an attempt to prohibit amalgamation of the races. The right in which the ordinance annulled was the civil right of white man to dispose of his property if he saw fit to do so to a person of color and of a colored person to make such disposition to a white person. It is urged that this proposed segregation will promote the public peace by preventing race conflicts. Desirable as this is and important in the preservation of public peace, peace this aim cannot be accomplished through means that violate the Constitution. It is said that such acquisitions by colored persons depreciate property owned in the neighborhood by white persons. Black people are going to hurt property values. But property may be acquired by undesirable white neighbors or put to disagreeable though lawful use with like results. So yeah, you know, people can sell to anyone that can harm property values. We think this attempt to prevent the alienation of property in question to a person of color was not a legitimate exercise of police power, the general power to do stuff, and is in direct violation of fundamental law enacted through the 14th Amendment, preventing state interference with property rights except through due process. That being the case, the ordinance cannot stand. Reaching this conclusion, it follows the judgment of the Court of Appeals of Kentucky must be reversed and the case remanded. Reversed, it is so ordered. So my friends, that brings us to the end of this case of, of the Buchanan versus Warley. And that was an interesting case, I think. And it, it actually was, you know what's interesting about it to me, and actually somewhat surprises me that they decided this, and actually unanimously, incidentally. So this was a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court. And, you know, it seems actually somewhat progressive for 1917. So, I mean, I'm a little bit, pleasantly surprised by it to be some to be honest that you know we got this opinion in 1917 but we did so hey that's 105 years of people being able to sell property without without city ordinances preventing it and i think next time we will do shelley versus kramer which deals with covenant restrictions wherein people tried to prohibit the sale of property by putting limitations in the deeds of houses and doing it that way. So, so try instead, instead of doing it through governmental ordinance, they tried to do it through private contract.
and then maybe next time we'll uh, cut, we'll discuss Shelley versus Kramer and do a follow on because that sounds fun. And again, I would encourage everyone who's here to help support Nick Ricada on Twitter. Please do the you read, please do the t tweeting and retweeting things at Team YouTube and all the rest of it. And you know, try to help Nick out because he is my friend. And he's about to start a stream on Rumble. That's that's good. And I I he is my friend and I I like him and I care for him on a genuine level. He was his YouTube channel was taken down. Uh, his YouTube channel was taken down, and so we need to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you were surprised because Kurt Wears is watching his left wrist, which normally indicates a person's right-handed. Yeah. So that's exactly right. <laughs> So that's all good. And Tish in Tennessee gave $5 and Claude Simeon gave me $2. And thank you very much. So is there anything more before I close it out? My voice is a little hurting a little bit, actually. So I can't talk very long. How the other night go? You mean the dating night thing? It was a bust. There were no really, there were no eligible women there that I was interested in. But there were only six, it was only six women. So, you know. It didn't pan out. But that's okay. I have another one coming up on the 8th. We will try again. It's okay. You know, you have to work your way through the, uh, the, then you have to find then you have to find someone that you like and also likes you back, man. That's just that's just rough. Spoonful of honey is a good call. I might do that. All right, I'm going to sign off for now, saying my voice a little bit. Twenty dollars from Jennifer Edwards. Thank you for being you. You're welcome. Thank you for twenty dollars, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Kiss a lot of frogs, something like that. Something like that. All right, I'm going to sign off for now. Remember to do the YouTubey things, like, comment, subscribe, do all that stuff. I've been on civil law. Until later, my friends, I hope all is well. Cheers, my friends, and good night.